the vast wetlands of southern Florida have become home to a foreign predator. Back now at 7.50 with a scary population boom in one part of Florida. Officially out of control and spreading. Burmese pythons imported from Asia as pets are now on the loose here. No one knows exactly how the pythons got to the swamps. One theory is that some escaped from reptile breeding centers damaged in Hurricane Andrew in 1992. But biologists think pet owners dumping unwanted snakes are a more likely source. And here we have uh, uh, an invasive organism that's very effective at eating all the species that we're trying to restore. In an attempt to control numbers, locals are being trained to capture and kill any pythons they see. The cull offers us a rare opportunity. I've come to Florida with anatomist Joy Reidenberg and biologist Simon Watt to join the hunt for the pythons. We want to find a giant snake and dissect it so we can reveal the inner workings of a truly remarkable animal. They call this the sunshine snake. I think they're being very, very optimistic. But more seriously, it's also the lightning capital of the world and we have to be out in the middle of it in a metal boat. To ensure we get the biggest possible python, our plan is to split up and see who can find the best specimen. What have you done to the weatherman? I didn't ask for it. My money is on snake expert and former marine, Jeff Fobb. Go find some snakes. You reckon you can find snakes even in this weather? Uh, it's possible. Well, the, the ideal way to find one would be as it's crossing the path and when it's in the open. That is the easiest way to find them. Their, their uh, camouflage is excellent. And what's the biggest you found here? The biggest one I've, I've ever caught is 14 feet. It's a big snake. Yeah, it's a fairly big snake. Tell you what, I'll take a look down the other side if you take Certainly. that side. So where you coming from, you say? From, uh... I'm from uh, I'm from Northern Ireland. We've we've got no snakes there. St. Patrick. Oh, no snakes. No, Patrick. Rather than track through swamps, I've come downtown to let the snakes come to me. This unassuming fire station is home to America's leading snake bite response team. If someone in Miami comes across a nasty-looking snake, these guys are there within minutes. Morning. Um, this is our little corner of the world. Um, we have our any venom bank. All of this? Inside there, that's all anti-venom. 95% of what's venomous and can kill you, we have anti-venom for. But are you finding that you're dealing with more and more constrictors nowadays? More and more constrictors, yeah. Three years ago, we caught 20. Two years ago, we caught 40. And last year, we caught 89. So we're getting a lot so more. So it's getting higher and higher if now. We're going to get one in the Miami area. This is the place to be. This is the place to be. So what do we do? Do we just have to wait around? Grab a chair. We'll just <laughs> hang out and wait. The minute I see one, all, everything just goes poof out of my brain and I jump on it. Joy has come to a python hotspot in the southern Everglades to search for snakes with seasoned python hunter Joe Wozielewski. So you're going to try and head it off at the pass, so to speak, yep. and bring it out here. I'm going to drag it out here. Probably grab it by the tail if I can. Once we have it in the open, once we have that thing focused on trying to bite us and not get away, <laughs> You. We're, we're, no, 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 no. We're, we're in this together. <laughs> All right. You have to tell me what I'm supposed to do then. Okay. Because I'm a little afraid if this thing's going to bite. I mean, how dangerous is that? Is this a serious bite? It hurts. Trust me. Uh, depending on how big, you know, they could cause some damage, but uh, they're not venomous, so they're not going to kill you, and that's good okay. news. Why are you taking me through the water when we should be looking for them on land? In many cases, they'll take refuge in the water. And, and that actually is one of the times when it gets a bit uh, scary. <laughs> All these little dots represent large constrictor reports or recoveries in Miami-Dade County. All the red dots, um, those are all Burmese pythons. And what's happening, these snakes are out here too, it's just that there's nobody out there to find them because there's no roads or anything, so people don't see them. Better response, Lieutenant Wood, may I help you? Okay. Okay. What color is he? 
Okay. And your address is? Okay. Um, just sit tight and keep an eye on it, and we'll get there as soon as we can, okay? All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, we got one. It's a snake in a bank. Cool. Wants to be interesting. And realistically, if you told me even five years ago that I'd be out here looking for pythons, I would have told you you're crazy. You know, that's how, that's how new this, oh shit. I got him. Here, wait, got you. Yeah, wow, I told you they're oh fast. Oh my God, that's huge. Wait, 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 grab the tail there. Let's just, wait, 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 pull it out. Keep pulling. Let's get the head towards me. Hold on. Wait. Don't. Okay. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. my gosh. <laughs> wow. No, that's not big. This is a small one. Actually, feel Looking the power. I am. I'm making sure wow. it doesn't wrap around me. <laughs> Grab it right there. You feel the two bones yes. right there. That's if the back you, of the jaw? Yes. If you okay. keep your hand there, because they can actually... How can you say kind of turn their heads? So okay. You got, got it? it? Got it. All right. I'm amazed you saw this. Well, I just brush. saw it move. I would not have seen it. Two two more seconds and this thing was in the bush. We, wow. Well, we might have found it, but I don't think so. Okay, Beautiful. let me just, let's just relax a second okay. here. Just take a deep breath. <laughs> it seems to be pretty calm now. Okay, to bagging it is another. Not problem, because we don't have any problems, but an issue. Okay. Um, so let's switch again. I got it. Okay. Take the middle coil, like right there, and put it in the bag. There you go. Ah. Oh, he wants a piece of me, wait. Okay, no, see, if I let him go now, he's gonna cut me. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, look at him turn. Yeah. Whoa. All right, one, two, three. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> High five. Yes! <laughs> Where is he? Right over here. We, we saw him, so we just wanted to keep him, like, under here. Oh, good like, job. Excellent. Oh, he's tiny. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, we were slightly disappointed to be honest. No, so was I. <laughs> they're actually, I they're actually looking for big pythons. Yeah. So no, sorry. If you wanna, you wanna well, what do retrieve I do? him? How do I get one of these? Just reach under there and get him. <laughs> yeah, but how do, how do you do? I have to have some kind of lightning quick reactions or something? No. Whoops. Ah, there you go. Here, boy. You got him? Yeah, I got him. Yeah. He won't. I mean, he might bite you, but oh, he's it's, so it's so tiny. So tiny, this little fella. I can see he's bright orange underneath. Mm -hmm. Is this a defense signal, mm -hmm. perhaps? That's a defense signal. So he's scared of me, pretty much. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is our first catch of the day. Next stop, Burmese pythons, with any luck. <laughs> By the end of a long and soggy search, I'd failed to see a single snake. Surely I can bag something bigger than the snake in the bank. Well, I thought we'd go to a place that the fire department took me to a snake breeder who lost several pythons in a warehouse fire in 2007. Where is it? In the freezer, help yourself. <laughs> That's enormous. That's one of my big females. I lost her in the fire. Oh, she's huge. Figure if you guys have a use for the dissection, you're more than welcome to it. Well, thank you. This is, this is perfect. This is just enormous. Um... Now the fun part is going to be getting her out. Would you mind giving me a hand, sir? Huh? Yeah, I think we're going to need it. Okay. Um, okay, I'll take the top off. Oh, holy cow. How do you... <laughs> Whoa. There we go. There we go. Now, surely this um, has to be the winner. Nowhere. Yes, no. Yes! 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 Okay, good, good. Will you see this, baby? With our python hunt over, it's time to compare catches and select a snake for dissection. Yes, no, maybe. Oh, yeah, it's, it's huge, quite frankly. Huge. What would you guys know? Yeah, and me, no. No, Joy's got one. Ooh, wow, that, she's heavy. that is very heavy. That's really heavy. Ah, uh, isn't that a beauty? That's, That's a lovely snake. Let's give her straight. Okay. It's quite pretty, huh? Let's just um, let's just get this one out in comparison. Oh my, oh my God! God. <laughs> Massive. I did tell Whoa! You. You're gonna need six people to carry this guy. Well, that is. Need quite a bit that of help, is absolutely but he's, huge. He's enormous, isn't he? 
Should we just right, um, take in the same way so we've got the head the same end? And let's just... Just stick the head side by side. OK, that is a, <laughs> that is a very big snake. Oh, my God. Look how big that this is. That is a huge, wow. huge snake. I didn't realize I can get this big. I thought mine was a big snake when I saw Two, it. <laughs> three. I mean, that's four meters. Is it really soft and mushy? Yeah. Very. It's probably not going to be the best. Oh, yeah, it's really mushy here. I haven't felt it since I've fallen, actually. OK, we've got Jeanette here, who's from Florida Atlantic University. She's the reptile anatomist. She's obviously looking after the science of these dissections. Your first impressions, Jeanette, about these two. I mean, this is a whopper, isn't it? It is a whopper. This, is, uh, this big bodied snake is probably a female. But it's um, it's kind of lumpy looking, and uh, this is this one died in a in a fire. Fire, I've been in a freezer for for what? nearly three years. Okay. Oh wow! Uh, so from an anatomy and a dissection point of view, is this going to be a suitable candidate? I mean, it's a great snake in terms of its size. But... It's it's got great size, but boy, is it, it the viscera are probably pretty pretty decomposed. I would say this is going to be not that useful an animal for anatomy. This one. On the other hand, is really firm still, and you know when I yeah. reach underneath, you know it, it keeps its shape. So uh, let's work with this one. I have another one over here that, that's from the park. So uh, and how big is that one? Uh, it's going to be a little bit bigger than this. Uh, we'll we'll lay them out and uh, make make the comparison. Okay, so we pack these back up, take them over to where we're going to do the section, then we can compare the two and, and crack on, yeah. From the outside, snakes may look like simple animals, but under the skin lies a remarkable story of survival. Snakes have adapted to thrive in almost every environment on Earth. Their muscles move their bodies with mesmerizing ease. They've evolved anatomy to sense, squeeze and strike their prey before they swallow it whole. Their ability to wait months for food makes them master ambush predators. As scientists, we want to show you the inner workings of the snake and explore how this extraordinary animal evolved. We're carrying out our dissection in what is a truly amazing location. It's a swamp camp right in the middle of the Everglades where all the action is taking place with the Burmese pythons. Our team just doing some basic measuring and weighing at the moment. For me, the most incredible thing about these giant snakes is not just for this female how big it is, but just look at this body. It is one massive tube with a head at the end. Right. We are so familiar with our own limbs. That's how we get around. That's how mammals get around. And yet, this is an animal that is incredibly agile. It, it gets all over the place, yet it does it with just a tube. But these, these animals are able to use a couple different ways of getting around. One of them is what we would call sinusoidal locomotion. So you'll see this, this snake putting its body into these S-shaped curves, and it's anchoring in one part and pushing the, the body forward with another part. That's the kind of classic snake slithering that everybody, if you ask a child to draw a picture of a snake moving, that's what you'd get. Exactly. It's this S-shaped curve that just keeps going by. And that's actually a bit hard for a real heavy-bodied snake like this female. A lot of times you'll see these snakes look like they're just moving forward in a straight line. And it's a little bit eerie, but it's remarkable. When we turn this snake up, you'll see that it's got these scales on the bottom. And each has a, mu a set of muscles attached to ribs. You're now really starting to whet my appetite here. I want to see under here and see these muscles that we're talking about. OK. OK, so where should we cut? Well, let me get it, get it started right up here. So we're seeing these muscles here, all of these white ones that are running diagonally, that are going into the skin. And they're actually going to lift the scales forward. Underneath them is a second layer, you can see them right here, that's going in the opposite direction from this layer over here. But the real power is actually coming from these muscles, which are right on the bottom. The graceful glide of a large python requires intricate coordination of muscles. As a section of the belly muscle relaxes, 
rib muscles pull it forwards. A contraction then drags the belly along. And a second set of rib muscles keep the top of the snake in sync. The pattern is repeated along the body to produce a steady forward motion. My brief is to get as close as possible to the animals. And here in Florida, that's not difficult. Around here, an encounter with a python is quite common. Their agile bodies take them almost anywhere. Pythons like this are just so at home in the water. You can see it gliding through it beautifully. Using that same sort of S-shaped motion that it uses whenever it's on the land. It's beautiful to watch. And their home range is pythons like this live very close to water. They're so used to it, they use it for thermoregulating, controlling their body temperature. They use it as a way of hunting, they use it as a way of getting from A to B. And here in the Everglades, pythons like this have been shown to travel up to 70 kilometers during the wet season. It's astounding. Okay, so we've been working on taking the skin off of this python, and when we peel it back here, what we see actually is a very beautiful structure. If you pull the skin, you can stretch it and recoil it back and forth. So you see how the scales overlap over, over each other, almost like a little accordion. And the reason they do that is there's actually skin underneath these scales. So that allows some stretch in here, which is really important because not only does the python have to curve its body moving through the ground, through the forest, or even swimming, but it also has to be able to stretch its belly when it swallows something really big. Imagine how much can this skin stretch around? Well, it can almost eat me. Not quite, but you know, maybe if I lost a little weight. <laughs> but you know, a, a python that was a little bit bigger could probably swallow me because it's really, really stretchy. Very stretchy skin. To show us how snakes curve and contort their bodies, Jeanette has prepared the spinal column of another large python. Wow, that is amazing. Compared to the 33 vertebrae of a human spine, this is truly impressive. This is hundreds. It's, this, this snake probably has somewhere around 300 vertebrae. 300, and 300 from birth. They just from get birth. bigger. That's right. So if we were to go and look at each one of these, what you would find is when you get that, that curve, it's really from a whole bunch of vertebrae bending, not so much a sharp bend in any one. And yet, what you're not seeing is any sense of limbs here. So does, does this come first and then in evolutionary terms, and then limbs are somehow kind of attached for a different form of locomotion, or does it the other way around? You've asked a really old question, and it's a really important question. So one of the things that we can show you is the evidence that these, these snakes are derived from lizards. And it's easiest to see these things in the male. And so I'm gonna turn this over, and you'll see these structures on both sides. These, these are called spurs, and uh, the males use them in reproduction and courtship. And what I'm, what I'm doing here is just simply uh, separating out the muscle from the body wall. Here, yeah. grab that with, with the forceps there. That's muscle, yeah. and, and here we have... Oh, you can see it. Look, look, at, look at the bone coming out. Yeah. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah. There we go. That's, that's the so, limb. So this is the equivalent of pelvis. That's the equivalent of pelvis. That's the equivalent of the thigh bone, mm -hmm. or femur, and this, this part is, on the end is like a fingernail? Probably, that would be a good so way to describe it. So you skip right over legs. So it's, yeah. so it's like... <laughs> and foot. It's like that. Exactly. That is amazing. Evidence, really evidence of evolution, yeah. that, that is incredible. This vestigial leg, now nothing more than a claw, is evidence that the ancestors of this creature once ran along on legs. Imagine you had an ancestor a bit like a lizard with a sort of lizard number of vertebrae. And then in evolution, the vertebrae got duplicated and duplicated and duplicated again. 
It's like a great goods train, just putting in more and more trucks in the middle. They're nearly all thoracic vertebrae from the chest. They lost the front limbs and the hind limbs. And amazingly, there are vestiges of the hind limbs still there. It's a very telling example of a vestigial organ, something that was once there and was once larger and has now almost completely disappears, but betrays its history by being still there in a reduced, modified form. Serpents have been synonymous with evil since the Garden of Eden. We have long been wary of their forked tongue and slithering movements. When pythons appeared in the Everglades, there was another reason to demonize them. Over its lifetime, a python consumes hundreds of prey animals. Florida's native species were under threat. Researcher Clay de Gainer discovered the first python. A field project radio tracking one of the rarest species on Earth, the Key Largo wood rat, came to an unfortunate end. The rat was found inside an eight foot python. This is what happens when a near perfect predator is let loose in a fragile ecosystem. The python's hardwired to hunt, it has no evil intent. And as for the menacing forked tongue, it is best understood as part of the snake's sophisticated senses. Snakes, as you might see very quickly, they don't have any eyelids, or they appear not to have any eyelids. In fact, what they have is an eyelid that has fused and covered the eye itself, and that fused eyelid is, becomes clear, and it's called a spectacle. And the spec it's a perfect name for it, isn't it? But it's, it's actually a scale, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, no, it's actually the eyelid. It's shed when they shed their skin? And it's shed when they shed their skin. Now, these animals do have a nose, but probably they're not actually smelling with the nose. They're probably smelling, from what we know about snakes, with the tongue. By waving that tongue in the air, they're picking up chemicals, just like we pick them up with our nose. So if the, the tongue were to come out and touch the, the environment, and then go back in, it would be placed back up there. That's called the Jacobson's organ, or the Vomero nasal organ. And in essence, that's their chemosensory area. So let's just cut that off so we can take a look at the tongue itself. Thank you, okay. So if we lay this tongue out, we notice that at the tip of the tongue, it's actually forked. So it has two prongs, a left and a right. This is gonna enable the snake to pick up chemicals on both sides, both the left and the right prongs of that tongue, and compare the left to the right side. And as soon as it knows which side it has a stronger scent on, that's the direction it's gonna go. Another really amazing thing that pythons have is the ability to see an image with infrared. And the infrared is associated with heat. And so the animals actually have a set of clefts that are their infrared detectors. So it's almost like having an inbuilt thermal imaging camera. Exactly. So what they're gonna see is the heater. So if they've got a prey animal in front of them that's say here, mm -hmm. they may not be able to visually see it, but actually they'll be able to sense the temperature of that animal compared to its surroundings, that's which right. says this is potential prey item. Python vision is poor, and they don't have ears to hear sounds. But make no mistake, other senses are finely tuned for nighttime hunting. They can feel even the tiniest vibrations in the ground. Their constantly flicking tongue picks up the chemical scent of prey, and their infrared sensors lock onto the target. Even in complete darkness, nocturnal snakes strike with near-perfect accuracy. These pythons in Australia are able to pluck bats out of the air. And this mouse may think it's free to forage under the cover of darkness, but the rattlesnake knows exactly where it is.
the venom kills it in seconds. Hey Tom, pleased to meet you. Hi, Tom Crutchfield, pleasure to meet you. Simon, pleased to meet you. Um, if you want to know your boas from your anacondas or your mambas from your vipers, Tom Crutchfield is your man. We'll go into the venomous room first. Where we thought In snake reptiles. breeding circles, Tom is a giant. His Florida-based collection of rare and exotic species is world-renowned. Okay. A visit to his venomous room is not for the faint-hearted. Here's an example of the most dangerous North American rattlesnake, the Mojave rattlesnake. It only takes about 15 milligrams of venom to be lethal for an average 160-pound man. Take a little more than that for me, weighing a little more than 160 pounds. Uh, this is a large albino cobra, which is captive raised. This is from Southeast Asia. This particular one is the Nayakutia from Thailand. This snake probably causes more deaths in Southeast Asia than any other snake. He's sitting up about, oh, about a foot or so, and that's about as far as he can strike. We don't have to run, we have. You can just tell this thing's angry. And it, it, I'm sorry? It's, it's, no, it's not angry at all. It's not? No, it's afraid. It's afraid. It's afraid. Okay. And I so mean, what just... would you do if a giant had you? Yeah. Now he's going to turn and he's going to actually try to bite me. That was actually a pretty good attempt. Too. So all these snakes kill their prey and would be attackers using fangs and venom. But I want to see some snakes with a much more brutal approach. Some constrictors. You got any of those? We do. We have constrictors. Okay. Now on this one, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to put your hand down, and when you get it, you're going to have to get it behind the neck. You, you can't hesitate. I don't want you to do like this sort of thing, because he's going to see that and he may strike at you if he does that, and he may bite you, in fact, if you do it. You have to simply put your hand down without hesitation and grab it behind the neck. Do you feel ready to do this? Um, I mean, yeah. the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to bleed a lot. I mean, I'm not going to let it <laughs> do much to you. Yeah, okay, I'm ready. All, All right. right, now, okay, let's go. Nervous, but ready. Okay, the head is right here. Come around on this side. Just get see it's looking at you. Don't, don't. Go ahead. Grab it behind the neck. Come on, boy. Get it out quick. Yeah. You can see oh, the. He's already trying to coil see me. The, yeah. See he's the. Going uh, for my see arm. He's already going In for your fact. arm now. The longer you're holding, the more pressure he's going to put. Yeah. And oh, he's, that's he's probably situation. already. He's already cutting the uh, the blood completely off to your hand. If you can imagine a much bigger snake wrapped around you. Yes. Every time that you exhale, he's going to squeeze tighter, and you can't breathe very shortly. You still, you don't die from lack of uh, oxygen. What you die of is a heart, your heart stops. Because that steady, consistent, hard pressure within just less than a minute, your heart stops and you die. But can you feel the pressure? Look at your hand yeah. now, the color. This snake is now piling on the pressure and this is what it does in defense or an attack. This is really its weapon. And snakes like this have been doing this for a hundred million years. This is a technique which worked and it stuck with it. Oh. Yeah, look at how his hand looks. It's, it's, it's literally purple. It actually, it's beginning to hurt now, isn't it? Yeah, you can feel a wee yeah. bit. Uh, it's even trying to coil around my back, if you can see. I think it wants to finish me off. And this thing's, uh, it's, it's going for it now. Do you mind taking it off? No, I can take it. Now, Patty, can you help? You're gonna have, she's going to have to unwrap it from the other side here. Hang on, turn it loose. Turn it loose. I got it. Got turn it to head. Yep. Fine. Oh. I. Oh. Let's put him back in the box. <laughs> it wasn't really trying. What really is scary to me is when you look inside this, kind of reminds me of that movie Alien. You've got like another set of mouth inside the mouth. Look at this, there's a row of teeth here. And then there's, there's also another row inside that. Look at this one right here. So there's two rows of teeth and they're curving backwards, which is absolutely amazing. So if you actually have an animal that gets bit by one of these teeth, its instinct's gonna be to pull away from it. But because the teeth are curving inward, that's actually gonna drive the tooth further into the animal and really secure and anchor that tooth into the animal so that it doesn't get away. What I need to get my head around is how they can actually swallow a prey animal that is many times the size of their own head. Because if I jack my mouth open, you go, ah, I can get a large burger in there, maybe. That's about it, but nothing bigger than that. How does it manage to end up with, its, with a head that size being able to take in something that's this kind of size? Okay, while our head is very fixed, a snake's head is very mobile in many, many places. In a human, the lower jaw is just one bone and it just articulates right with the base of the skull. But in snakes, they actually have a very complicated lower jaw. It has another intermediate bone that connects the lower jaw to the skull. It's called the quadrate bone and you can see it being moved right now, right in here. 
the quadrate bone acts as a double hinge, allowing the mouth to open to an astonishing angle. Unlike in humans, the left and right sides of the jaws are completely separate. Each is free to move as the mouth splays even wider. An extra set of upper teeth move back and forth as the snake walks its jaws along its prey. With the teeth leading the way, the python pulls its body over its meal. But with a mouth and throat full of fur, how does it breathe? This is the beginning of their breathing passageway. This is normally going to be locked up into the roof of the mouth like that to create a nice passageway from the nose all the way down to the trachea and then down to the lungs. So they're normally nose That's breathers. a normal, yeah, that would be the normal yeah. at rest position. But if you've got something big in your mouth, that's going to separate this and block it. So what these animals would do is actually extend this forward. So even if the so if, the, if you grab there, this, yeah, if I just, there you go. There you go. So you've got that opening there. It's almost like having a, a snorkel you can stick out of the front of your mouth to breathe. You know, not only can they stick this out, but the cartilage gives us this windpipe some support. So it's not totally crushed flat. Mm -hmm. There's still an ability to breathe. God, I'm loving that this animal. Amazing. It's just amazing. <laughs> There we hey. go. Yeah, so now he's coiling around oh, it. He thinks it's a live rat, of course. He has not been eating for three, four months, so he's really, really hungry. Given the chance, pythons will consume meals as large as their own body. But if food is scarce, they can last for months on nothing at all. There. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've come to a basement lab in Denmark where Professor Tobias Wang studies how pythons cope with this diet of extremes. So we can see the entire snake here. The rat is lying here in the stomach now, just a few hours after ingesting. You can actually see the jaws of the, of the, of the rat. You can see the spine. Okay, so here we have the snake one and a half days after eating the rat. And you can now see that the rat is, is gradually disappearing. The head yeah. is no longer recognizable. We can't see the, the four limbs. So within the next day or two, this rat will disappear completely. The CT scans show how large quantities of stomach acid break down every last bit of the prey. In order to absorb nutrients from large meals, the intestines undergo a remarkable transformation. Here we have the snake that is fasting, and here it is 24 hours after eating the rat. So what you can see here is the fasting animal has this very small, small intestine. Mm. When we then look at the animal 24 hours after eating the rat, so the rat is in the stomach, but look at the small intestine, enormous increase. In the hours before food arrives from the stomach, the python's intestine swells to an incredible size. But a big intestine takes energy, so between meals, it shrinks down and switches off. So it's perfectly adapted to feasting and it's perfectly adapted to famine. Exactly. Gosh, look at the size. Look at the size of this. What is this? This is all esophagus? This, I mean, this is stomach. This is stomach and look, look at the size size of that intestine. I wonder what's, it doesn't feel like there's anything in there, but oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. What are the, what are, is this, this is all fat. We're gonna need to open this animal up Sounds and like see. A lot of fat. There's a lot of fat. Okay, and, and some of this, there's, oh, look what we got here. Cool. What's that? The ovary. <laughs> look at that. Oh, look at this. So this snake was getting ready to breed there. They, they, they basically start off with little tiny follicles. Oh man, look at the oviduct, wow. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so each one of these is a potential new snake. Right. But it's the very start of it. It's the yolk and the egg inside it that then has to get swallowed by this little tube called the oviduct. And there's a kind of, it's like a production line for producing new snakes. This hole that Joy's got her finger into now is just an open-ended tube. That tube has to swallow 
each of these one by one and it essentially feeds the tube over the yoke and it flows then down this tube here. We're so, so delicate. It's then fertilized by the male sperm that's come up the oviduct from reproduction to produce one of these. And it's this that then carries on moving down the oviduct and then be laid out through the cloaca but there'll be a whole chain of these coming because there's about 20 eggs there. So all those will come down the same production line. And when they come out, they then all get stuck together and you have a clutch of eggs. But a clutch of many more than that because you know, this is just one side. You know, we can see on the other side of this. So if we flip that out of the way. That there's another ovary and you'll notice that they're staggered one in front of the other. So this other ovary is all the way up here. These, these structures right here look very much like what we would call uh, corpora albicans, which is the scar from previous matings and pre previous years. So this could be, if you actually counted up all the scars and these mm -hmm. eggs, you've got some kind of indication of the number mm -hmm. of offspring this female's produced, yes, which could yeah. be a very big number. Yes, it could. Yes, it could. Back in 2006, Everglades biologists found their first python nest it confirmed their worst fears. The pythons were breeding. In their native habitat, python hatchlings are eaten by birds and jackals. Here in Florida, they have few predators. Alligators will attack them, but they're not part of their natural diet. Surprisingly, pythons will sometimes eat alligators too. although this one proved too much to stomach. The python's only effective predator is us. We're going to allow hunters during hunting season, if they come across a python, they're going to have the legal right to shoot them. But taking on giant snakes is not a task that should be taken lightly. <laughs> hmm. What else have we got here then? Well, we do have here also the longest of all living snakes and the only snake that occasionally kills and eats people, and that is the reticulated python of Southeast Asia. Okay, help me get it out, guys. Silence up running right there. Okay, Here just keep pulling it out. Oh, it's heavy. There. Yep. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You got it? Yeah, yeah, just got a hold okay. it. Okay. Just a bite. This thing is huge, isn't it? This is only medium sized. It's well. medium sized. So they get a lot bigger than this, I take it. Yep. I once sold a snake to a Mr. Ludadano of Serpent City. It was a, a wild caught, about a, a 23 <laughs> or 24 foot reticulated python. He went in the cage with it with one other helper, and I had already I advised him actually not to do that, at least to have two or three people. But somehow the snake mistook him for prey. It bit him, constricted him. His friend began stabbing it with a knife, which didn't work, and his friend then got uh, panicked and ran off. The snake constricted him and actually killed him. He was clinically dead. <clears throat> Fire rescue got there and they used the uh, defibrillators like they use on human hearts to start yeah. them. They shocked the snake. The snake released Lou and then to start Lou's heart again because basically he was dead. Uh, they used the defibrillators and brought him back to life. He actually was on the Oprah Winfrey show. Crikey, that, he got a lucky getaway. He, he was an extremely lucky man, extremely okay. lucky man. You feel comfortable enough to hold the head? I'd love to give it a shot then. Okay, right? come here. So we need to pull now I want you to put both hands around its neck. So one here. Tightly, yes, tightly. One here. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this now goes. This really gives you more of an idea. Now you're understanding the power of this thing. Yeah. I think this guy's getting a bit fed up of being handled, actually. We should put him back in, should we? Let's do that. Uh, let's do this, guys. I want one of you to undo the front of the cage. Uh, go do that, Alex. Open the front of the cage there. Uh, whoa, guys. Somebody's got to help me here. <laughs> it is getting seriously oh. hard to handle at this point. Yeah. Uh -huh. Where are we taking it? Putting it in here. Into the big cage. OK. Yeah. Now we've got to go around and close the back, though. Whoa. Yeah, there he is. He's happy. Yet again, this is an example of it. It's it's more afraid of us than we are of it. It's just wanting to get away. Yes, all that was sick, which simply 
to Stop try to protect freedom. itself. <laughs> and a snake like that is not a snake any one person should ever try to handle alone. The section is getting to a fascinating stage now because the team have taken all the internal organs out and what you're left with is this fantastic impression of what a snake is, is a backbone with ribs on the sides and muscles that create this kind of gutter, if you like, that goes all the way down the body right to the tail. But laid in the gutter is everything that Joy and the team have laid out on the other side of the table. And you've got pretty much every part of a snake, the internal workings of a snake, all laid out in a row here. Jeanette, you've got the heart out She has there. the heart right that here. That is absolutely stunning. Yeah. Like so much of the snake, it's, it's an elongated structure. And no, and no diaphragm, so we've got, we've got liver right next to lungs and right next right. to heart. And then here, two kidneys. Yes, and look at how it's all squiggled up, very unlike our kidneys, which look kind of like a big bean. And then this massive fat store. Yeah, this is amazing. Who would think that in such hot weather, a snake would need so much fat? This is fat for energy stores to make this. Yeah. you pass me the knife? Joy has noticed something strange about the lungs and wants to fill them with water to take a I'll closer a look. It now. It's, going, it's going, can you see it move oh, down yeah, there? Oh yeah, look at the Yes. Oh, here it goes. There it goes. There it goes. See that? Yeah. Look, look at this. This one's filled. Yep. This is the shorter lung, this is the left lung, and this is the right lung, going all the way down to here. I wouldn't have expected this kind of asymmetry, that these lungs are two completely different lengths. For whatever reason, maybe because it enabled them to wrap themselves around bigger prey, snakes became longer and longer and longer. And as so often in evolution, that had secondary consequences, that raised new problems. And in particular, how do you pack all the internal organs into this long, thin tube? Well, in the case of the lungs, snakes did something rather interesting. And the right lung stretches way, way down the body. But the left lung is tiny. And in some snakes, the left lung disappears altogether. In the case of the kidneys and ovaries, it's similar. But in this case, the organs are just staggered. One of them is in front of the other. It's an answer to the problem of how you pack organs into this very long, very narrow tube. I've got, that's ovary, you don't want that. GI content. Our dissection team's final task is perhaps the most important. We must search the python's gut to find out what species it's been eating. Wow, she really hasn't eaten that much recently. Yeah, oh, but look at that. Wait, wait, wait. There's a tooth. There's a little something. A There's a tooth. tooth. There's a tooth. So well, that definitely needs to be in the bag because they'll want to look at that under a microscope, yeah. won't they? Yeah, right. Put it right there. OK, we're getting to some lumpy things here. Oh. Right, what is that? Now, should I pour some water on this, or do you want to take it? What is that? Shall I clean? Yeah. Water, is that hoof? That's hoof. That's it a should? hoof. That's a hoof. <laughs> no, 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 sure? no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, it's not. No, it's a, it's a, it's a bird. That is definitely hoof. <laughs> wow. Well, I thought it was a beak. Yeah. No, it is hoof. This is absolutely amazing because when you clean this off, it is really obvious that this is one hoof from a small ungulate. So that's a, um, a two-clawed animal. There's hair, there, hair here as well, isn't there? Yeah, look yeah. at how long this fur is too. Okay, so this, so this was quite a big there. animal. I mean, this would have been standing on here like that. This would have been an animal, I guess, would have been this kind of size, probably, up to its oh, head. Wow. We do get, we have feral pigs, we have small deer, we have feral goats. That's, uh, not a, that's not pig, that is definitely either deer or possibly goat, probably more likely deer. Wow, look at that. I've never seen this many sticks in a snake. <laughs> now that must have been in the stomach of the animal. It was of the eating. animal it's eaten, surely it wouldn't have. It, it certainly wouldn't eat it on purpose. That's amazing. It is astonishing, isn't it? It's the last bit of our dissection, finding that hoof, is the kind of proof you need. Here is an animal that is able to take huge prey, many times bigger than the size of its head, swallow it whole, and then has such an efficient digestive system, it can digest every part of it apart from a little bit of fur and one toenail. That is extraordinary. The 
the toenail belonged to a white-tailed deer. Just one of the many animals on the menu as the pythons conquer the Everglades. It's an odd story that these animal snakes with their immense length, their, their loss of limbs, should be so successful. And yet they are. They're in every continent of the world except Antarctica. And perhaps it's a lesson in how successful animals can be if they take what looks like a disadvantage and turn it into an advantage. There's one final twist to the Everglades story. The Sunshine State gets a blast of cold air. January 2010 brought the coldest weather Florida has seen in decades. No one knows how many pythons died in the freeze, but biologists fear the worst. It'll take more than a cold snap to halt this remarkable animal's invasion of Florida.